Last week, we began writing our code to recognize handwritten digits from the MNIST dataset. We wrote it as a function. We put some help documentation in the top of it. We put some error trapping in and we loaded in the data and then we stopped. If your memory of that is a little bit fuzzy, I would suggest that maybe you go back and watch at least the last five minutes of the last lecture, just so you can remember exactly what it was that we did. We're gonna pick up at the same point. I'll briefly recap what we did and then we'll move on. We load the data in and then we start working with it and we write a neural network. Okay, so let's move over to MATLAB then. Here we are. Here's our MATLAB code and these are the notes that we made. So this was our demonstration of digitizing a handwritten number. This was my number two and this was how I digitized it. We then moved through and we talked about the MNIST data itself. The MNIST data itself is a 28 by 28 digitization. So this is just 10 digits, sorry, 10 pixels horizontally by 10 vertically. The MNIST data is 28 by 28. The data files are arranged in rows. The first element in the row is the label or the target. This is an integer between and including zero to nine. So if there's a seven in there, it means that these following digits, all between zero and, 50, and 255 inclusive, represent the digitization of this number several, seven. There are 784 numbers here following the first one, which is 28 squared. And these are the 28 squared pixels. What we did in order to visualize these data, these digits, was we normalized. We normalized the zero to 255 range right down to between zero and one. And we did that by dividing all of these numbers by 255. We have a neural network then that takes in as input these 784 values all normalized between zero and one. We're going to have a three layer network because we are essentially following what is done in the book. We're doing it in MATLAB, in the book it's done in Python. So from the first to the second layer, from the input to the hidden layer, there are weights W2 and biases B2. And from the hidden layer to the output layer, there are weights W3 and biases B3. I've just realized, by the way, that often I'll use a double underline for matrices and a single underline for vectors. And I, I haven't done that here. So in order to be consistent with what I often do, this probably should be double underlines on the Ws. But hopefully we know now what we mean. I haven't drawn all the connections. There's lots and lots of connections coming out of here to every single node in the hidden layer. And we've chosen that the hidden layer will have n subscript h neurons. And we'll be able to choose this in our code. The hidden layer then feeds through to the output layer and the output layer has 10 neurons. And these neurons are supposed to fire just one at a time. So for example, if the fourth one fires, that will correspond to the input being hopefully a three. So if the network correctly recognizes a three on the input layer, then the fourth neuron here will fire. So it's one more than three, right? Because the first one is zero, and that means the second one is one, all right? So the fourth one is three. So it's gonna be one more than the integer that's being recognized. What's actually gonna happen is that um, the number that will come out won't be a nice, sorry, the vector y that comes out won't be a nice tidy one hot encoding like this. It will be rather noisier, okay? But we would hope that the largest value would be the one that indicates the one. However, a three might get confused with an eight. And it may be that we see this kind of thing happening where a three is in a sense confused, confused by the network and confused to become an eight. So there's a little bit of a competition here. And that's, of course, why we have a confusion matrix. The confusion matrix suggests the level of confusion. So now we have this map then, this plan of where to go based upon this simple digitization scheme. 
we came over here and we started to think about writing our code. We have 784 input neurons, input neurons, NH neurons on the hidden layer with an activation function sigma 2, and 10 neurons on the output layer with an activation function sigma 3. We have W and T B2 between the first and second layer, and W3 and B3 between the second and the third layer. X is the input vector, Y is the output vector. This is the feed forward algorithm. We set A1 equal to the input X. N2 is W2 transpose A1 plus B2. Then we take N2 and we feed it into the layer two activation function to get A2. Then we take A2 and we put it here and we, we repeat this step, but for the next layer. So we, instead of an N2, we now have an N3. Instead of a W2, we have a W3. Instead of an A1, we have an A2. Instead of a B2, we have a B3. So we repeat these two steps here. We get N3, we feed that into the third layer activation function, sigma three. Out comes A3. If we had more layers, we would just keep doing this. But here we're at the output layer. So we set the output equal to A3. Once we have these quantities, we can go down here and commence the back propagation. We take T, the true value corresponding to X. So in this particular case, it would be a seven. So this would be the true value. We'd encode it in this way. So we take the true value and we subtract off Y. And Y would hopefully be a good approximation to T. It may not be in the early days of training, in the early stages of training, but hopefully once the algorithm's trained, it will be. We take the error then at the third layer, E3, to be T minus Y. We use a backpropagation method, in this case, the unscaled heuristic backpropagation as described in the book. We can determine E2. This is the error that has been broadcast back from layer three to layer two by W3, E3. Once we've got these two errors, we can take the derivatives of the activation functions and take these N2 and N3 vectors up here, and we can build these matrices A3 and A2, and these are diagonal matrices with these values down the diagonal. Once we have the A3 and A2, along with these errors, we can build these vectors here, S3 and S2, and these now give us everything we need in order to implement learning. And this is the gradient descent update of the weights and the biases. So we take W3, for example, this matrix, and we replace it with itself minus the learning rate alpha times A2, that's this one, times S3 transpose, that's this one. Similarly, we can update the biases by using just alpha, the learning rate, and S3. So this set of notes here gives us everything we need in order to make this code work. So we came over here and we started to type our code. We set it up as a function, ANN08 demo. It had these arguments, the number of epochs, the learning rate, a choice for the data, if data was one, we're going to use the small training set. If data was two, we're going to use the large training set. Remember, we've got a small set of data, MNIST data, with 100 items in the training set and 10 items in the test set. And we've also got these much, much larger data sets. Now, we don't want to use the, largest train, the larger data sets until we're happy that the network is coded and debugged because it'll take a long time to run. Uh, we have another um, variable here called BP for back propagation. If BP is one, we will uh, use heuristic unscaled back propagation. If it's two, we will use heuristic scaled back prop. We have a GFX variable. If this is a non-zero number, we'll show graphics on the screen. In fact, they'll be docked in the MATLAB console here. If it's zero though, we won't show the graphics and we may not want to show graphics. Again, if, we could, if we're cheering through this very large training set, I think there's 60,000 items in it. We don't necessarily want to be plotting 60,000 pictures on the screen. 
NH is the number of nodes on the hidden layer, that's over here. And then the outputs, well, YN and ON correspond to N for training, and YT and OT correspond to T for test. Okay, so it's the last letters of those, no, sorry, the, the, not the, the last letters of test that's being used for the T and the hard N in the middle of training being used for N, or the last letter of train, depending on how you want to think about it. Y are the exact values. Just remind you what that means. So the Ys look like this. These are exactly encoded. We do that. We do that by preparing our data. And the Os correspond to these messier, noisier outputs from the network. And the reason we return both of these sets to the environment is then is so that we can then plot a confusion matrix. The MNIST CSV files are not to be altered in any way, and they should be in the same folder as this MATLAB code. So let me just show you what I mean. Here is this demo code. There's a whole load of other stuff here that we don't have to worry about, but these CSV files, these are the ones that we downloaded, and they are in the same folder here, which happens to be in my MATLAB drive subfolder here. Where you put it is up to you, but just make sure that these files are in the same place as the MATLAB folder. Otherwise, you're going to have to be careful when you load it in because you have to tell MATLAB where, where the files are. Okay, we said that this code was based on the, on the book, and that's good practice. We set up some useful defaults, line width and marker size. I like to do this. I'm, I don't insist that you do it. It's up to you. And then we, we added this sort of professional touch, and we wanted to test the validity of the inputs here. So these green commented lines, because they um, are directly under the function keyword and there are no blanks, these will come up if we type help, okay? So if I type help, ann 8 demo, that's the name of the file and the name of the function. They, they should agree, they, you should make sure they're the same. I'll get, these lines, exactly what I typed here. This is my nice help lines. And then the first bit of code after the defaults were to test validity of the data. So we said, if the, no, if the number of epochs is less than or equal to zero, or the learning rate is less than or equal to zero, so this is an or, either of them need to be true for this to be activated. They, don't, they can both be true, but um, only one of them needs to be true for this if statement to evaluate a true statement, then we're going to throw this error up to the screen. Okay, so we're going to say they're not valid inputs. We're also going to say that if data is not one and data is not two, so this time it's an and, right? Because if, if neither of these are true, that means that we don't have a well-defined training set to use. Similarly, if the backprop is not one or two, we don't have a choice of a backprop. If the graphics is not zero, we're going to clear the previous graphics windows and we're going to set up um, the new figures to be docked. Right? And again, I'm only doing that so that you can see it because if, I, if it comes up in a separate window, it won't get captured in the, in the recording here. And also, if we're going to say, if, if the user asks for the uh, the number of hidden neurons to be less than zero or less than or equal to zero, then that's going to be an invalid choice as well. Once we've done that, we can think about loading in the matrix. So if data is equal to one, we're going to use a small training set. So we're just going to read this matrix with a hundred training points. On the other hand, else, so if data is not one, we're going to read the large training set. And then I kept a, a record here of the last line that we executed. I think it was the last line that we executed anyway in the last lecture. So I just typed this down here. And you can see that I've asked for minus two for the number of epochs. And according to this line up here, n epochs is going to be less than or equal to zero. And so we should get an error. So let's go down here and do that. There we go, there. NEP, NEP, and or LR are not valid. That's exactly what I asked for it to type. Okay, good. 
and and then we that was as far as we got it actually i just kept a record of the last line that we executed but we can get rid of that now um the very end here is an end and that end statement ends the function good so let's go on them what do we need to do next well by reading in this matrix what we've done is read in all of these rows okay in this particular case there's a hundred rows because there are a hundred digits in the training set so we've got a hundred rows the first element in each row gives the digit that is being represented by the remaining elements and the remaining elements are these numbers between zero and two five five so the first thing that we've got to do is to normalize all of the numbers from the second column onwards on every row we want to normalize them to be between zero and one and also we probably want to store them in columns because that's what we've done before Let me remind you, the last major code that we wrote was ann07demo.m. If I just pull that back up so that we can have a look at it. This was um, the one where we had the four quadrants. And what we did was we generated inputs x1, x2. These were the coordinates of points in those quadrants and we arrange them in columns. Okay, so the first, the first column contained the first point x1, x2. So the first row in the training data, in the x train, the first row corresponded to x1, the second row corresponded to x2. And these were the inputs, x1 and x2. So here, we would want this to be the first row, and this to be the second row, and this to be the third row, and so on, if we want to do it the same way that we've been working with, um, this, if we want to work with it in the same way that we were working with previous examples. Now, all that means is that we take this matrix of rows and simply transpose it into columns. So, what are we going to do? We are going to convert and normalize the data. We're going to do it like this. We're going to say that X train is equal to the matrix A. This colon here means take every row in the matrix because the first element is always rows. So we're going to take the first row. Sorry, we're going to take every one of these rows in the matrix. And we're going to take every column from number two up to the end. So we're going to take every column from here all the way up to here. So not column num number one, but column two up to the end. We're going to transpose it so that each of these rows becomes a column. And we're going to divide by 255 so that all of the numbers in these boxes are between zero and one. And that's now our training set. We can figure out the number of training points. Now, I know that there's going to be 100. And I know that in here, I think it's 60,000. But let's suppose that for some reason, we're going to use a different training set one day or a different input file. We don't want to hard wire those numbers in. Instead, we can see how many training points there are by looking at the dimensions of this matrix. And we can do it like this. N train is the number of training points. And we just say, let's look at the size of this matrix. Now, the size can give us either the number of rows or the number of columns. If I put a one here, it'll tell me, how, tell me how many rows there are. If I put a two there, it will tell me how many columns there are. And I want to know how many columns there are because I've just turned each row into a column. And each column represents a digitized number. So the number of columns tells me how many digitized numbers I've got in the training set. Now I need to set up the outputs, the Ys. And we're going to one hot encode them in the following way. So I want to start off 
with a matrix of zeros. The easiest way to do that is as follows. I know that there are only going to be 10 rows because of this. Okay, the first row, if it's a one in the first row, then I'm encoding a zero. If there's a one in the second row, I'm encoding a one. And all the way down here, if there's a one in the 10th row, I'm encoding a nine. So please notice that it's ever so important that we're incrementing by one. If there's a one in the first row, I'm encoding a zero. If there's a one in the second row, I'm encoding a one. So whatever number is being encoded has a one in that number plus one row. Okay, so if I'm encoding a four, there's a one in the four plus one row, i.e. row five. This is five. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we're going to have to, you know, actually implement that in a minute. It's a little bit confusing. So we then have a Y train, which is a matrix of zeros with 10 rows because of this. And we need a column for every training input. So there are N train columns. What we're going to have to do is loop through every single column and set up a one in the correct row. So I'm just going to put this in and then I'll talk about why it works. For i equals one to n train, this means loop through every single column. And in that column, so whatever value i is, we go to that column here and we say one more plus whatever number is in the first element of a for the row index. Okay, so whatever number is in the first element of A, that will give us this. So for example, in this case, it would be a seven. We do seven plus one to give eight. And we say that row eight in this column becomes one. Row eight would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This row becomes a one because this row encodes seven. So after we've completed this step, we've looped through every single training point and set up this one hot encoding of the output. And these are what are eventually going to be called the T values, the true values or the target values, which we'll use to compute our error. Right, the next step is to just set up a few default variables, just the simple variables. We can see that, for example, that there is a fixed number of inputs, 784, and a fixed number of outputs, 10. And we know that these numbers influence the dimensions of these matrices here. So let's put those in, because they're not going to change. So we'll say that ni and no are the number of input and output nodes. I'll just type them in like that. Okay, let's give ourselves a little bit more space here. And now let's think about setting up the weights. I'm going to do it in a following way, and I'll invite you to play around with this as much as you like, but I'm going to set the weights up to be random numbers between one half and minus one half, and I'm going to set the biases up to be zeros. Okay, so W2, this matrix is going to have, I'll tell you what, let's make that a little bit smaller so that we can see what's going on. Let's, let's move that over there. And let's just move that over there. Okay, it'll just make life a little bit easier. So W2 here is a matrix of random numbers uniformly distributed between zero and one with 784 rows and NH columns. What I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract the, these numbers between zero and one from one half. 
and that's going to give me uniformly distributed random numbers between minus one half and plus one half. Similarly, W3 is going to be the same um, type of random number uniformly distributed between minus one half and plus one half, but now this matrix is going to have NH, row, um, NH rows and 10 columns. The bias factors are going to be initialized to be zeros. So I need NH components in the vector B2, and I need 10 components in the vector B3. So that takes care of my initialization. The next thing I need to set up are my activation functions. We're going to choose sigmoids. And we'll talk about why in a minute. We've done this sort of thing quite a lot of times before, so I'm just going to paste them straight in there. Okay, so set up sigmoid activation functions for layers two and three. So this is sigma two and this is sigma three. Over here, we notice, um, sorry, over here, we notice that we need the derivatives of these activation functions as well. So we set them up at the same time. So this is sigma two, and this is the derivative of sigma two. And this is sigma three and the derivative of sigma three. And we've, again, we've done this sort of thing quite a lot of times now. Okay. Why are we choosing these type of activation functions? Because we also know that there is a ReLU. Well, sigma three produces this output. And we know that these numbers here in, in this output y should be either zero or one. Okay, now we know that they're not gonna be exact. They might look something like this, but nevertheless, we want them between, we want them to be between zero and one. So the sigmoid is, is exactly the right thing to choose for that. The sigmoid is between zero and one. And in the book, there's some discussion about um, what we might call feature engineering, which uh, which talks about you know, how you can add a little bit to the zero and subtract a little bit off the one. We're not gonna do that. We're just gonna leave it as it is and see how it works. But we know that the output activation function ought to be a sigmoid because, well, these numbers need to be between zero and one. But what about these? There's no real reason to believe that these have to be sigmoid because we don't really know what the outputs represent on this layer. So I've just chosen them to be sigmoid to see what happens. I would encourage you to play around with that. Change that choice. Change it into a ReLU. See what happens. Do you get the same results? Are they better? Are they worse? A lot of this subject is about trial and error. It's about gaining experience. Right, we're almost there now, we can almost begin the training. Okay, we need to do the feed forward, back prop and learning. The one other thing that we've learned that we, that is useful to do, and that is to keep a track of what we call the performance index, which is the sum of the squared errors. So what we do is we calculate the sum of the squared errors at the end of every epoch. So I'm gonna set up a row vector to store those numbers. It's gonna have one row and it's gonna have n eep, the number of epochs columns. And I'm gonna call it square uh, for squared error. And I'm gonna start it off with all zeros. And then Every time we complete an epoch in the training, we can work out a squared error and store its value in the appropriate column. So now then we think about training. And this is how we begin. We train by loo looping nep times through the training set. So here is a double loop. We go from one to n train through the training set, and we do this this many times. Each one of these loops has to have an end statement.
Now you've seen this type of thing before. What do we do? We pick out A1 as the input. So that's the ith column in the training set. And we apply this feed forward algorithm. So the first thing we do is we forward propagate to the next layer, activate it, and then we repeat. So let's just put these things in here because we've deliberately spent quite a lot of time on this so that none of this is now a surprise. So once A1 has been set up, we can determine N2 here. From N2, we can determine A2. And then from A2, we can determine N3. And from N3, we can determine A3. If we had more layers, we could simply keep duplicating these lines with a shift in the index each time. But in this particular case, we're at the output now. A3 gives us the output. And we've been calling the output Y. Y is the output. And remember what, it, remember what Y is. Y is a vector with 10 elements, hopefully, all of which are zero, except one of the elements, which is one. But in practice, this kind of thing happens. So Y looks like this. In this training set, the ith column corresponds to some digitized integer. And the exact encoding of that integer is stored in the Y train values that we encoded here. So now we've got this y, we can calculate the error by taking the target value in y train and subtracting off the output from the network. That's the first step in the back propagation algorithm. We can broadcast the error E3 backwards to the second layer using unscaled heuristic back propagation. But we remember that up here, we gave ourselves a choice of BP. We would use heuristic unscaled or heuristic scaled, depending upon whether we gave a two or a one as the choice. So let's go down here and think about how we're going to do that. It would seem to me that the best thing to do is to set up an if statement. We could do something like this. If BP equals one, backpropagate by using this heuristic unscaled backpropagation. And that corresponds to this here. BP equals one is heuristic unscaled. If BP is two, we want to use scaled, heuristic scaled backpropagation. So we would need to do an else. I'm actually gonna do an else if. So we're gonna say else if BP equals two, we're gonna implement this algorithm, which is the heuristic scaled backpropagation. And then we can put an end statement here. Now, whether you put it there or whether you tidy it up and put it there is entirely up to you. You might also like to line your code up like that. Your choice. The reason I put an else if and not an else is because one day, quite soon now, we're going to study a different type of backpropagation based upon calculus. And then we might want to have a third option in this code. If BP is three, do something completely different, okay? But we're not there yet. We haven't started studying that yet. Okay, so we've got some way towards this then. We've calculated the error. 
and the back propagation, we now need to figure out the A's and the S's. Well, the A's are these diagonal matrix involving the derivatives of the activation function acting on these N's, N2 and N3 up here. So these are quite easy to calculate and they don't even depend upon error. So we could actually put them here before we back propagate. Okay, or you could put them up here before you even calculate the first error, E3. These quantities here do not depend upon error. They depend only upon the choices of the activation functions and the n values here, these vectors n2 and n3. So we now have the error, the error of the second layer back propagated, a3 and a2. The next thing then is to compute these s vectors, s3 and s2, and we can see that they just depend upon a3 and e3 and a2 and e2, and we've just calculated those quantities. So we can come down here and compute the S vectors. There they are. S3 is minus 2A3E3. Three three. There it is. And S2 is minus 2A2E2. Two two. So we've done our feed forward. We've done our back propagation. And now we just have to implement the learning, the gradient descent updates. And this is where we use the learning rate. The learning rate, remember, is supplied here as the second argument. So let's put those updates in. Here they are. W3 is replaced by itself minus the learning rate times A2 S3 transpose. B3 is replaced by itself minus the learning rate times S3. And the similarly for W2 and B2. And that's it. We've just implemented all of that. So we don't have to have that bank line now. We can come down here. But remember, at the end of each epoch, that means at the end of each one of these internal loops, we want to calculate the squared error. So at this point, we would like to loop through the entire training set again calculate the sum of the squared errors. We want to store that sum in this matrix. And the column in which we're going to store it is going to be this column. Okay, it'll be the first column to start with, then the second, then the third, and in the end, it will be n ep, column n ep. So this is a for loop, so we ought to have an end. And now it's a question of what goes in the middle. Well, what goes in the middle is we need, for each element in the training set, we need to find the output. And that means we need to find this output here, Y, for every input in the training set. Now we can actually write this in one line. Like this. y is equal to sigma 3 times n3, but n3 is w3 transpose times, well, is a2 plus b3, but a2 is w is sigma 2 here, sigma 2 of w2 transpose a1 plus b2, and a1 is x train. And x train, we're going to take the ith column because we're looping through every column. So this is no more than this. 
And you may ask yourself, why did I write it like this up here if I could have just written one line? Well, you have a think about that. Maybe press pause. Have a look at this and see if you can see why I wrote it like this here, but wrote it in one line here. Okay, so have a think about it. Press pause now. Okay, are you back with me? What did you think then? Did you, uh, could you see why? The reason is really simple actually. Uh, deceptively simple, it's nothing deep at all. It's just that in this step, the back propagation, we need N3 and N2. We need these intermediate quantities. In this step, the gradient updates, we need A2 and A1. We need these. So we need this one, this one, this one, and this one. So it makes sense to write them out and calculate those quantities so they're available to us down here. Once we've done this though, we don't need them anymore. So here we can just write it all in one line. Well, we're gonna calculate the sum of the squared errors and we're gonna store it for plotting. So we now need to work out the error and we know how to do that. It's Y minus the network, <clears throat> sorry, it's the network output Y subtracted from the training output Y train. And again, we're on the ith column of y train because we're looping through every set, every element in the training set. So that's the error. Now, we're going to do the following thing. We're going to take whatever number was in the current column, and we're going to add to it the square of the error. The square of the error, though, is actually a norm. It's the length of the vector squared, because y is not a scalar. It's actually a vector. So we have to do this. Each error, y, is itself a vector. So to square a vector really means to find its length and keep it squared. Finding its length means find its norm, its two norm, and square it. So we take whatever was in square error, we keep it and we add on the squared error for input i. And we do this for every single input. And what this will do is it will sum over all of the input training data for every value of i. And once we've done that, we can finish. At this point, we would hope that our network is trained. What we've done in the past was we've learned that we could plot this quantity. So let's do that. And we're going to plot it in a subplot. And we're also going to remember that we're only plotting things if we want to. Okay, we have this this option, GFX. If GFX is not zero, show the graphics on the screen. So let's come down here then, because this is the first time that we've had some, the opportunity to plot anything. So let's use this option now. And we're gonna say that we'll add a subplot. We'll plot the performance index, that's the sum of the squared errors, versus the row vector of number of epochs. So if the GFX argument is not zero, we're gonna do this plotting. So again, we need an end to match the if. Now we think about what's gonna happen inside. Well, the simplest thing I think is this. We could add a subplot. We could put some more plots in later on, but let's not do that just for the moment. Let's just make it a complete plot. So at this point then, we should have taken our data here, prepared it, encoded our training outputs, 
initialized our network and looped through the training set n ep times and performed updates on the weights in the biosphere. So we should have a trained network and we'll see what that training looks like if we plot this performance index and if we can see the sum of the squares of the error declining as a function of the number of epochs. So we'll save it and we'll run it. So let's come down here and let's run. Now remember that minus two is invalid. That's going to give us an error. So I'm just going to run it with this and see what happens. And there you have it. That is the decline in the performance index over the number of epochs. So we've only got two epochs, so it's not a very uh, interesting looking graph. It's just joining up the sum of the squares for the first epoch to the sum of the squares for the second epoch. It's just joining them up with a straight line. Now, the fact that we've got this red error here is nothing that we really need to be worried about just for the moment. If we go back to the top, we see that this function is supposed to supply this output. Well, we haven't figured those out yet. We don't know Well, we do. We know what the exact training and test outputs are, the YNs and the YTs, but we haven't figured out the ONs and the OTs yet. So we haven't actually assigned these values. So we'll do that in due course. That, that's not nothing to worry about at the moment. We're just interested at the minute in whether the training is working. So let's increase the number of epochs maybe to 20. And let's see what happens. This is looking pretty good now. So this is our performance index. This is the sum of the squares of the errors. And we see that as we increase the number of epochs, we see that that's declining, eventually getting really close to zero. So the errors are going down very, very close to zero. Now that indicates to me that we've written good code, that it's doing everything it should do. So the next thing then is to test the performance of the code. What do you think? There's a lot going on, isn't there? Now, we have written these codes together before, so we know what's involved. But even so, it's a bewildering amount of stuff to do. And I do know that if I just do it like this, it looks like it's going too fast and feels a bit like a roller coaster and you can't keep up. Press pause, stop, think about it, code along with me. Use the help pages. If you really can't figure something out, Trust me, trust me that it works, make a note of it, and then you can talk to me. You can ask me in the seminars. Okay, so now we've trained our network, we need to test it. First thing we're going to do is test it on the training input because it's been trained on the training data, so it ought to test well on the training data because it's seen it before. Again, it's, I keep using this exam analogy. It's, it's like if you do 10 past papers, and then pick one of them out to actually get your grade, you should do well on it because you've just done it. You've done it. You've trained yourself using it as a past paper. So the real challenge is how well do you do on an unseen paper? The real challenge for a neural network is how well does it do on unseen data? But that doesn't mean to say it's not reasonable to test it first on the training data. So the first thing we're going to do then is we're going to look and see how well this training is, has worked and we're gonna look at that on the training data. Okay. That's gonna to have to wait though, because we've run out of time again. So we'll pick this up in the next lecture.